there are certain presets where I I don't even, like in most cases, I, I understand what's going on, but sometimes I'm not 100% sure what happens under the hood because they don't tell us. And I also don't care because I just like it and I just use it the same way every time. So sometimes I discover something like that. This is the Self-Recording Band Podcast, the show where we help you make exciting records on your own, wherever you are, DIY style. Let's go. Hello and welcome to the Self-Recording Band Podcast. I am your host, Benedict Hein. I am a mixing engineer. I run a mixing studio called Outback Recordings. And at the studio, we're mixing about 250 songs per year for bands and labels from all over the world. Um, it, most of them is like rock music. Yeah, all, everything that falls under this kind of rock umbrella, typically. And this means that a lot of the stuff is not recorded in big studios with big budgets. Some of it is, but not all of it. A lot of it is... DIY recordings from bands and artists all over the world. And this also means that we have to solve a lot of problems in these mixes sometimes. And we have to coach the artists, get the best results at the source before they even send it to us. And this is what led to this resource and this podcast that we have here. So uh, we are helping you now improve your recordings and get better results from your jam spaces and home studios. Both Malcolm and I and my co-host have a lot of experience there and we're trying to help you with this show. If you are discovering this on a podcast platform, please know that there's a video version of it so you can watch on YouTube. And if you're already discovering this on YouTube and want to listen in the car or while you're doing chores or working out or whatever, you can do that on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you enjoy podcasts. So today um, we are talking about presets. And this is kind of a hot topic almost because, you know, there are presets for a reason, and I think Malcolm and I and most of our peers use them pretty often, actually. Um, but then also, of course, everyone says, like, don't use presets, be intentional, and, you know, dial in your plugins a certain way, and, like, don't assume the preset's going to work. I think, yeah, we'll see what Malcolm thinks. I personally think both is true. Both things are true. You can use presets successfully, but you should also not just rely on presets. And in this episode, we're going to walk you through this, share some of our favorite presets, when and when not to use them, how to make best use of them, why they're even there, and all those things. So, as always, I'm not doing this by myself. I'm here with my friend and co-host, Malcolm Owen Flood. Hello, buddy. How are you? Hey, man. I'm good. I'm going to embarrass you right off the top. I Because uh, you just told me the craziest thing before we started recording today that I didn't know about you. And uh, so if you are a listener to this podcast, you're probably aware that the self-recording band and Benny have a crazy, like, thorough one-on-one -on -one coaching program, taking people through how to record their own records and all of that. Um, and part of that, which I did know, is that you will mix a song for them in this process as well. Yeah. But what I didn't know is that you will do it in whatever DAW that they use, which is like the craziest thing to me that you know how to use like any DAW <laughs> and can mix a song professionally in that DAW as well. That's like, that's mind blowing in both like the skill side of that, that you're able to figure out all of these DAWs and learn them so quickly and then be able to mix in them. But then the value that you're like providing back, then you can send them the mix files. You can send yeah. them like, hey, here's your mix. You can literally open it and see everything and use it as like a template for the rest of your album. That's, that's amazing, man. It's like, <laughs> Thank the, <you. laughs> there's other people doing coaching, but I don't think there's anybody on the planet doing that. That's like, that's really working with, with your bands and your artists. That's so cool. Oh man, thank you so much for saying that. Yeah, I, I truly think we are doing something unique there, and it was very painful to first <laughs> yeah. of all get the DAWs and then learn and them into the first. Yeah, to buy all the DAWs. Yeah, yeah, expensive. And uh, honestly, it's interesting. You said that like I've I've created templates and, and sent these to people, but so far nobody wanted the mix files yet. Uh, it's interesting. Oh, really? that I haven't even uh, done that, but yeah, I can definitely send the sessions out as well. Um, but yeah. What the coolest thing is I mix these songs and then the whole point is that we do a mix walkthrough where we open up the session together and I just did one this afternoon before we uh, recorded this episode where I mix the song for someone then we sit down and then I open up the session and I show them every single thing that I've done in their mix and I can do this in my setup, my typical setup and sometimes people want me to do that and but I can also do it in whatever the, the they are using. 
Uh, and yeah, it's been super painful to learn that to get the DOS, but it's possible. And I, I'm not saying I like it in every single DAW. For example, I just don't like mixing in Ableton, but it can be done if I have to. So yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That is. I mean, it's pretty cool, man. Good work. Thanks. That's awesome. <laughs> Thanks for saying that, dude. <laughs> I never. I don't really th even think about these things so much. I just always think like, what can I do to make this more valuable, whatever? And then I add all these things to the program. And we really built a package now that is like I don't know. Like there, there, I'm very sure there is no other educational platform that does it that way it also means that i'm working crazy hours i enjoy it but it's also a lot <laughs> yeah yeah it's a lot but like but, i feel like so many of these like coaching programs are actually i'll teach you how to do what i do kind of thing not i'll teach i'll help you learn what you want to be able to do and like that's really shifting it to that it's like it's not here's how to do it my way it's here's how to achieve what you want using how you do things in your room with your gear with your DAW of choice with your music it's like that's yeah, as custom as it gets awesome Pretty thank cool. you thank you for saying that yeah uh, if you want to experience that by the way go to the self recording and there's a little apply button you can read on the page what it's all about and then there's a little apply button that takes you to a questionnaire and when you do that, when you fill out that thing, I can tell I, I, I can see I can get an idea of whether or not this might be a good fit for you and if it is, uh, you can book a free first call. We talk about it together, see where you're at, where you want to go, and whether or not I can help you. And then we either end up working together and you get to be a part of the self-recording syndicate, this coaching program, or you just get an hour of you could just get an hour of free coaching on that call and you know what to do next without me. So um, yeah, worst case scenario, you just get some advice and clarity on your situation. Totally. So yeah. The self recording band.com. Now, uh, Malcolm, I want to ask you a, a thing. So and before we, and I promise we get into the presets episode really quickly. Okay. But like, <laughs> did you, after all these like TV gigs that you've done and stuff, um, did, did you go get back into like running and, and, and working out <laughs> and all that at all? Or was, was the whole doing sound in the woods, whatever, is that exercise enough? And you're just I, now I not, mean, not uh, into running in the woods anymore? <laughs> it's a good question. It, I mean, it was exercise enough. On that gig in particular, we were hiking like, like 18 kilometers a day on average. So lots of walking and I was carrying like a lot of gear. So it, I came back feeling totally in shape, um, which is nice because not all gigs are like that. Um, but that one was pretty physical. Uh, but I did, <laughs> I've been home for like two weeks now, I think, and I definitely didn't run for most of that. <laughs> no. I've only been out for one run since, and it felt amazing to go back and do. So I was just thinking before you asked that question, coincidentally, I'm like, got to go for a run. <laughs> oh, that's good. So yeah, it's so coming get back. Get out there today. Yeah, if the, yeah, if you are, yeah, I think, I don't know, but it's probably the same for you. If you just don't work out for a while, it, yeah, at, at some point there comes the, the there's it, it it just you just need to move again. <laughs> so you just need to move again. Yeah, you start yeah. wondering what's like missing, what's wrong, and then you're like, oh, I haven't been exercising, and that's it. Yeah. It and doesn't have to be think, running, but the, any the kind of exercise. The big thing for me is that I'm jumping on a, as you know, Benny, I'm jumping on a plane tomorrow to head out your way, oh, yeah, it's more, um, but with a pit stop yeah. in Ireland before that, and planes totally knock me out of my exercise schedule and they, they're also just like the worst you're sitting there it's like a really long flight I've got to because I've got a bunch of connections so it's just sitting doing nothing for so long so getting the run in today before that flight is crucial I think yes it is yeah good for you awesome <laughs> oh yeah I feel like we haven't talked about about that in a while and uh, I've actually yeah, talked to a bunch of our st uh, listeners Lately, some of the on uh, on these, some of them on these uh, clarity calls that I just mentioned when you when you apply for the program, but also some of the students uh, or listeners as well. And there is a surprisingly, at least to me, surprisingly high number of runners in there. I don't know if it has, has to do anything with our content, probably not. But like, I, I'm, all I'm saying is, people are have been pointing out that they enjoy us talking about running. I'm sure it's still a, uh, the minority, and most people don't care about that at all. <laughs> But I know that there's at least a few people who don't mind us talking about running every once in a while. So, yeah, yeah, but you're right. Like, we haven't talked about running in a long time. <laughs> I mean, like, yeah, I got busy and wasn't running as much. You, I don't know, are you running a lot? <laughs> no, I mean, let's not get into this on this episode, maybe. But yeah. like, um, that, the short version is not so much. Just because I was focusing more on strength lately, I just, I felt like after doing the ultra last year, I was kind of... My next goal was a little too ambitious. I couldn't do it for health reasons and other things, like an even longer race than that and all that. And so I kind of, I always need a goal or something. I, I I run because I enjoy it, but also I'm a person, like I want something to work towards and like some kind of goal. And then I was like, you know what? 
I always felt like I was not, I didn't have the strength that I wanted my entire life, basically. I always was like good when it comes to endurance, but I was also prone to like injuries and like in general didn't have the strength that I wanted from sitting all day and all that. Like long story short, I focused on that. I'm enjoying it a lot. I've put on some muscle, I've lost some body fat, and I think that will help my running too. And I just feel good um, doing that. So that's my main focus now, but I will definitely get back into running. It's just, I'm going to find a balance between the two. But right now it's more more weights and strength training. Yeah, Right on. Well, at least you're keeping fit. Exactly, yeah. And the real reason, and the, the probably the real reason behind this is that I'm, I got scared at some time, at some point this year where I was like, I'm getting old. I, I don't know what it was, but I realized I'm getting older or like I felt the first time in my life, I'm like, like I'm getting old. And I was like, if I don't like, build some of the muscle that I want now, all I can do in, in the future is just keep whatever I already have, but more yeah. or less, you know? And so yeah. I was like, you better put on something that so that you can then afford to lose a bit of that as you get yeah, older. And so that was kind of the realization that I had is like now or never sort of. So, it's yeah. a reality, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Anyway, back to presets. presets. So, yeah. so first of all, a plugin preset, if you're not aware what that is, is like if you buy a plugin and you just load up the default preset it's usually set so that it does nothing or not much and then but you can then choose different types of presets that other people have created for certain situations so there is a preset menu you can pick one of that and this this is like a certain this it's like a certain setting of the plugin um, that you can choose and then decide if you like it or not so yes. that is that is you can save your own presets. Like it's a snapshot of a certain setting of a plugin. That's what a preset is, basically. Yeah. I think it's important to talk about the kind of like history of where why they started coming around, because that actually is kind of fascinating versus where it's ended up. Um, because the original preset is like I find myself having to do this tool the same move over and over again. It's something I always want on a channel. So I have to open up the plugin dial that in, and that's just a waste of time. So a preset lets me recall a setting for a situation, and that for a situation is really important. But what started happening is then it started getting built into the branding and marketing of plugins. Of This one comes with presets so that you already get a sound kind of thing. And then they started getting attached to like celebrity names as well. You can get so-and-so's presets, which is just going to make you sound so much better. <laughs> yeah. And it started becoming this kind of like really nonsense thing where it's like you can get the sound of CLA because his presets are loaded into this plugin. Sound of hits. But that's, it's just like, that's not really how presets work. They are circumstantial settings that somebody uses for something in particular pretty often um, and ultimately they're they're just they're going to save you time because like that could just be a, a lot of my eq presets are just cue points set in certain places they, they don't change the sound at all they just make it so then i can change the sound quicker so i've got like one that's like a tilty cue so now i can just you know with one knob get a tilty cue move where before i'd have to click something assign it to be a tilty cue it's just like they, they're they're with a, a scenario in mind, but they don't actually, they're not going to give me, they're not going to like magically create a great mix, <laughs> no matter no. what I want. As, as much as I wish that could be, they won't do that ever. So that's kind of the misconception of a plugin preset. It, it, it can be really useful, but not for the reason that we're taught anymore. Yeah. And that's where people, like there, there's kind of this polarization. It's like if you mix with, if you mix and use presets, you're not a real mixer where there's other people that are like, I use presets all the time, what are you talking about? It's really, this is what it boils down to, I think, is that the marketing of presets has created this kind of illusion that they can do something that they don't, um, even though Benny and I are probably both going to break that rule with some presets that we like later yeah. in this episode. Yeah. <laughs> totally. uh, but, uh, but in general, that's the misconception, I think. Would you agree with that, Benny? I would. And I think that actually some... So I, you said why presets have been created. I think that some mixers create presets for themselves, like you mentioned, to make mm -hmm. their own lives easier and make it make certain things that have worked before uh, easy to like recall and do again. Um, and then the other solution is where the other scenario is where they do it for a certain company uh, to create 
starting points for people or for the company to be able to market the product better because if it has presents from X, Y, and Z, then people think if I use them, I will sound like that. Uh, the thing is, those, uh, there's so much you could talk about here. Um, like, they are not a mix for your solution, like you said. I'm, I totally agree because presets ignore the context. Like, they, if if some famous mixer, if if they go and create presets for a new plugin that's coming out, they will listen to a source, a track, whatever, and do it in the context there and try and build a preset that solves a certain problem in that situation. And then that becomes the preset. Maybe they think about, well, if I keep it a little more broad, it might apply to more things and whatnot. And they sure do. But at the end of the day, it was the right decision in that moment. And then it got saved as a preset. It doesn't mean it works on yours because yours is completely different. Yeah. So I want to give a yeah. really practical example of yeah, that um, to help people out there. And that with a vocal, most com vocal compression presets are to make something that is very dynamic, less dynamic, and compress it. That is like the goal of most of the presets you're going to find. But if you have recorded a vocal that is not dynamic, you've already compressed it, for example, now those presets are not behaving like they were created to, like they were intended to, because the job's already done. So you're now throwing in an already dynamically restricted signal into a preset that is going to try and further do that. Um, and the the result will be a totally different thing. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, exactly that. And so the the thing is still, they can still be good starting points and still work. Um, but there's another thing you need to take in, into account there. So the one thing is the context of the song. The other thing is the personal taste of the person creating the, the, the preset. Because it might be that a certain preset is a good starting point for that person and they can use it every time on every mix and just tweak it a little and it always works. But it still could be that it doesn't work for you just because you think differently about music, you hear things a little differently, you have a different taste and it just doesn't work for you. So um, there was this, when I was at NAMM earlier this year, I ran into Andrew Sheps a couple of times actually, but once I got a, a chance to just chat with him real quick, which, which is awesome in and of itself. But like talking to Andrew Sheps, he was saying that for a long time, he was chasing um, certain sounds that Chad Blake got because he's a Chad Blake fan and the way he distorts things and does things, he loves that. And he said, to the point where I sat down with him, I copied his settings, copied his presets, used it on the same damn thing, basically. And it just didn't work for me because, I don't know, when I hear his mixes, it works. But when I do it, even if applied to the same source, my brain just works differently and I want to do different things and I just can't copy whatever he does. So I just gave up on that. And I think that was that was super interesting to hear. Like, doing the exact same thing with the exact same tools, even on the same song, made him still think, like, how should I really do this? Because it's not his workflow, not his style. And, and the way he gets the overall result is just different. And and so so that's something you need to take uh, into this um, uh, into consideration here as well. And um, so all that being said, I think... If you just go through these plugins, uh, plugin presets, when you get a new tool, it's, it's still a good thing to do, a very helpful and interesting exercise to do because you'll find that certain things just tend to work for you naturally and it makes sense and you can use it as starting points and others you just be like, what should I do with this? Like I'm like this all the time when I check out plugin presets, sometimes I'm like, oh yeah, I'm going to use that exactly that way because it works. Or I, I use a slightly different version of that. And sometimes I find things of well-known mixers where I'm like, what were they thinking? I can't, I don't know what, like, I can't get this to work. Forget about it. Yeah. Yes. So. Yeah. yeah. So what's <laughs> annoying and frustrating about this episode is that we're, every time I think about something that I want to say, I can also contradict it yes. and say the, the opposite. 100%. Um, and so like one example of that is that by using presets, you are, kind of missing an opportunity to learn a plugin um, because a lot of decisions have been made and you don't know which of those decisions is what caused it to sound a certain way. So like an amp sim is a really good example of that. It's like, okay, now it, like it sounds so different. Was it where they, how much gain they used on this or was it that they changed the cabin and I didn't even notice that? Yeah. Was it like that they bumped the input up so it's driving it harder? Like you don't have a clue, right? But on the other hand, maybe that preset gets you thinking about a sound. Like, I didn't, well, this is so different. What is it? I hear more low end is so much tighter. And then you go looking for that. And so presets can simultaneously prevent you from learning, but also cause you to learn. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
And I find certain brands do this better than others. I really like uh, like uh, friends of the podcast, Corn of Audio. Their presets are like almost labeled by like the feeling of sound they get. <laughs> it's yeah. like yeah. thick bottom kick, and I'm like, oh, that does have a thick bottom now. Why? And I go looking for that kind of thing rather than like like dance special kick sauce you know like where like they're yeah. like i don't know what this yeah. did it just sounds different to me kind of thing it like kind of leads you down a, a line of reasoning which is nice to me um so i find like that i find exciting of like learning a new plug and seeing what it's capable of but you do have to go hunting for okay what actually happened here why do i like this and hopefully learn how to do that so that both so you can like tweak it from there if it's close or just so that you know how to do that if that you just want to like modify from from no preset, one hundred percent. I think the more you know about the in, the individual parts of a plugin, a preset, a chain, whatever, the more useful the preset gets. So the the what's the weird thing here is the funny thing is most like presets are most used by people who know the least about mixing because they think that uh, they don't know what to do with all the knobs. So they go to presets and then they get some kind of usable result more or less. And it's logical that, that it is that way. But it's funny that the people who know most about mixing can make the best use of the presets also because they can in, they can choose something, know why, or why, not, why, uh, why they like it or not, know exactly what to change about it and analyze it the way you just described versus someone who's new to mixing or doesn't know it they might accidentally find something that they like, but they have no clue why it happened, like you said, and they have no clue what to change when it doesn't work. And so, yeah, it's like this, yeah, again, you can, can go bo both uh, ways. A classic example is what I've mentioned in last week's episode about when we talked about being intentional at the source. Um, let's say you want to find, back to Ampsums real quick, if you want to find a great amp tone with an Ampsum, and you just pick a preset, and most like I know from experience of talking to so many students, they will just go through the presets until they find something that they like, and then they call it a day. And every time I ask, like one of the exercises in the program is to get really good source tones and put in the work to figure out how to mic a cab and what and all that, or the virtual cab. And every time when I ask them, like, did you try a different mic position? Did you try a different IR? Did you swap out the amp and and leave the cabinet the same, or vice versa? They don't even know what I'm talking about. They just all they do is open up the Ampsim plugin, choose a preset, and that's the sound basically. But there's so much value in being intentional about the chain that you're creating. And once you've done that and you mastered that skill, then the presets become so much more useful and so much more fun because then you pick one and you're like, ah, oh, that's not really what I wanted, but I like this about it. Let's see if I tweak this thing, then it might get me where I want it to be, or like all these things. And so in, it's the opposite. It's the, the difference between you setting up an amp and a cab, then adding a pedal, then adding another pedal, then adding a microphone, then moving the mic and doing this in order like you would build a real sort of rig until you like it. The difference between that and just someone throwing in some, a certain rig into the room and being like, that's it, you got to use that. And if, if you just plug into the existing rig... You don't know why you like it. Is it the is it one of the pedals? Is it the way the amp sounds? Is it the mic position? Is it what, like what is it? And if you don't like it, how do you troubleshoot it? So I I think you get the idea here. And it's the same with con complex plugin chains and plugin presets. Um, so yes, presets are useful and a great starting point often. But if you don't know what's on what's actually going on, if you don't like it, you're stuck. You can't do anything about it basically. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I, I think the more we talk about this, the more it boils down to that. I'm like, be wary when they are advertising it as a solution to your mix. But by all means, use presets to discover things, yes. to learn things. And uh, and in certain instances, actually, now that I'm thinking about this, here's a really good example yeah. from presets that are very useful, is effects. Because then they are essentially a thing. <laughs> like if you open up yes. uh, Sound Toys, um, Echo Boy, like probably... Yeah. One of the most, it's definitely the top three most popular delay plugins on the planet, I'm sure, but by pros, anyways, like when we're talking not stock plugins. Uh, if you want to slapback delay, it's going to have a bunch of slapback options for you, and they will be a slapback delay. Like, that's kind of less up to opinion. It's like, yes, this will be a slapback delay, um, or like a dotted quarter. Okay, you click a dotted quarter, like now you've got that. Um, so, and same with reverbs, like plate reverb. 
Room Reverb. These are essentially presets, uh, and uh, depending on like unless they're modeled kind of things, um, that is gonna that is just saving you time essentially. You're like, all right, now yeah. I'm in some kind of plate reverb, and I can tweak from there again. That's a really good example of when yeah presets can be awesome. One hundred percent, totally. And it's and and sometimes it's just such a good example because. So first of all, what you just said, it's easy to pick a certain type of effect using the presets, but then also some of them are so weird and crazy, you would never be able to come up with them. And so just going through the presets, you'll just discover fun things where it doesn't matter if you know how they did it. It just matters if you like it or not. And if you do, just by all means use it. So there's a couple of weird effects in Echo Boy. I have no idea what's actually going on and I don't care, but I like the sound or I don't like it. And it's an effect. It's a creative thing. It doesn't, like you said, there is no right or wrong as there is like with you know, compressing a vocal or something like that, there is a wrong way to do it and there's a way that works with the song. But, you know, slapping on some crazy robot, alien, ambience, whatever thing on my vocal, like, right. there's no right or wrong there. Either like it or not. No, you're and, just going yeah. for the weirdest thing possible and seeing what's possible. Yeah. yeah, it, yeah. That, that and that's is, fun uh, with presets for sure. And I'm very glad, thankful for those because I would never sit down and create all of those. Like, I just, I just love to be able to go through them and see if I find something cool. Yeah, you're kind of hunting for inspiration in that instance. Yeah, that's a, like a very fun example of using presets. Um, yeah, it's more so like, I hate to throw them under the bus, but like isotopes, like you use this uh, this software, which has like a compressor and EQ, a widener, delays, reverbs all built in, and then it'll analyze your signal and come up with the perfect preset. Like that's where I'm like, well... I don't think so. Nope. <laughs> I think that's going to be a lot of bad decisions compounded. And uh, yeah, and anytime I've heard those, I haven't been impressed. Like, no, ever. Yeah, same, same. Um, so like it, and they make really good stuff. So just to clarify, Isotope makes insane stuff and I do use their products on every mix I do. Yeah. So that's uh, like, it's still like an episode of con like contradicting myself, I feel like. <laughs> yeah, but totally, all the but, time. And me too, but that's part of it. Yeah, but I don't use that specific tool that is to me that is cheap marketing aiming at people that are scared of getting it wrong and, either that um, yeah that, that is, it's that and or um the assumption that people who are going to be using it will know what they're doing and will read the manual and all of that because what happens with those things is like you can get great results with those but so if i use the isotope presets and, and let it analyze my signal and all that, I can still then go in and fix whatever it got, it got wrong and I can be intentional about it. Maybe it gets me to a starting point like quicker, whatever. So if that is the assumption that pros are using it that way, fine. But like the problem is that people who don't know what they're doing are using those presets and maybe they, in most, in many cases, they get slightly better results than what they could do on their own at this moment in time when they're just starting out. But then it also keeps them from getting better because they think they've done all they could. Like they've used this pro preset. It must be the ultimate thing. Mm. And so they stop learning and improving and just trusting that this is it, not even knowing what would have been possible if they took the time to learn it properly. So right. that, that's the thing. It can get you to a good starting point fairly quickly, but then you stall and you don't progress any further if you just rely on those in the, on those tools. And that's what happens a lot. And I see so many, also if you're some of the students, when I look at their mixes sometimes, sometimes I give them feedback and then I'm like, I need to see what's going on there. I don't really know. And then I see the sessions and how crazy they sometimes are, how crazy the chains are and what they put on top of other things and just trying to solve things with, with presets, not even really knowing what they're doing. And then they say, yeah, but I got this exciting tool, this plugin, I just want to try it out. And then there was this cool preset. I saw it in this video. And they use all the things that they see from other people and all the presets and all it, but it like, it still, it, it does... It, it works kind of, but never really serves the song and ignores all the context. And then it's super hard to troubleshoot that because you have a bunch of presets that haven't been chosen intentionally. And then where do you even start? And oftentimes I'm just like, let's remove all of this and let's use like two bands of EQ and a simple compressor. And, right. you know, and so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, that, it, it is like a tricky thing to hone in on, but I'm glad we're talking about it. Um, now, all that said, yeah. are there any plugins presets where you're like, oh, okay, I do just click that button yes. though and I love it. <laughs> yes, and I completely, I get, like like you said, we're contra this, it's, I'm contradicting myself uh, as well here. There are certain plugins where, those presets, where I I don't even, like in most cases, I, I understand what's going on, but sometimes I'm not 100% sure what happens under the hood because they don't tell us. 
And I also don't care because I just like it and I just use it the same way every time. So sometimes I discover something like that. Um, and so let's go through this. And when I say every time, I mean every time that it works, I will try yes. it. And then either, so it's not that it's on every mix. It's like this one setting or none at all. Like there's some tools that I use and I try my preset that I like and then I make a decision, does it work or not? And if it doesn't work, I don't even bother tweaking it. I just use a different tool. I have some of these things. It's very similar to... Um, when you see CLA or any of the big mixers using analog stuff, if you've ever watched a CLA video where he mixes on his SSL with his racks behind him, he never turns around and touches those racks, almost never. Because what he does is he has a certain compressor set a certain way for lead vocals and then another option for that and then he has one for the guitars or whatever. And like he has these hardware tools that have been not touched basically in decades and maybe a couple of options. And all he does is like he tries this compressor, works, doesn't work. All right, let's try the next one. Works, doesn't work. Like he just makes yes or no decisions and switches to a different tool, which is essentially presets just in hardware. And then he moves on. So I do a similar thing. I have a couple of things that I like in certain situations and I'll shoot them out against each other. And if they don't work, I don't tweak the preset. I just go to a different go-to thing until I find something that works. Sometimes, like... Yep, I hear you. So, yeah, give us give us a couple examples. Okay, cool. So, um, one that I, if you've been in the coaching program, or if you see if you've seen me do it, like in any videos, um, also public videos, um, these past couple of, I would say years, like a year or two, um, you'll see the Shadow Hills mastering compressor. And I honestly, like, should I? Sh I've never done this on the podcast. Maybe I should share my screen real quick and show you these things if you're watching on yeah, YouTube. Why not? Let's see if that works. So here we go. So this is the Shadow Hills Mastering Compressor. And this one is like, if you don't know what you're doing, if, and even if you know what you're doing, this is a pretty confusing thing. The, the real thing, but also the plugin. It is tons of knobs, different options. Like it can be super overwhelming. Um, I, I often use it intentionally, but there's one thing I particularly like, and I use it either that way or n no way at all on, on the drum bus. And this is a preset called Drums Discrete Iron. And it lives on my drum bus and I turn it on, see if I like it. And if not, I turn it off. More often than not, I like it. And it's not because of the compression. It's because of the saturation and this iron transformer thing in it. And whatever it does, it just makes, the goal is, or what I want from this is it makes my drum transients a little more punchy, uh, chump a little more out of the speakers. And if that's what I want, I just pull that up, turn it on, aim for like not even a dB of gain reduction. It's really just for the sound of this thing. And then I call it a day. So this is something that I, I don't touch any of the knobs. I just use the preset because it has a certain sound. And if it's what I want, I use it. Awesome. This is one of those. Then let's see what else we got here. Um, there's none of these. Um, let's see. I got, a, I got a couple. So there is uh, here the MicroShift Sound Toys again. The ver Just the default preset, honestly, is what I end up using a lot of the time. It's just 100% wet. It sits on an effect return. I send vocals to it and... I just like it. Sometimes I switch to a different style, but just the default is just awesome the way it is. It's just yep. a classic micro shift effect. What else do we have? I have, um, oh yeah, that, that one. I, I don't know. I don't remember how I figured that one out on my master chain here. So my mix bus and master are two different things. This is my mix bus, which gives me my unmastered mix sort of, and this is my mastering chain. Um, and so I have a plugin here called, um, Mu by Pulsar, which is a manly, manly very Mu emulation, and I I was struggling with that thing for a while because it was always like too grabby, almost. It sounded great, but I never could get it to work the way I wanted to, until I found a preset called Classic minus three dB. I chose that, and all I do is I change the threshold and input one of the two or both, so that it hits 3 dBs, which I assume is what it's supposed to do here, 3 dBs of gain reduction. So I just adjust my input signal, basically, to get to give me 3 dBs of gain reduction. And then I turn down this mix knob here to 30%, pretty much exactly, every single time. And it works on 90% of my masters as the perfect glue <laughs> compressor that gives me two extra dBs of headroom, but while being completely transparent, you couldn't tell if it's on or off, really. It makes it slightly thicker, but honestly... Super subtle, but it gives me like a lot more headroom. It sounds a bit thicker. It glues things together. And I never change any of the other parameters. I didn't even look at what they are, actually. I just found this thing, dialed it in 30%, dialed it in to be exactly 3 dBs of gain reduction, and it's magic and works 90% of the time. 
Awesome. Love it. Yeah. So these were, uh, these are kind of basic examples here. Um, then what else do I have? Yeah. Like the, the, the typical ones you mentioned. So lead vocal, vocal stereo delay, echo boy. There is one that I created for myself and self and just saved. It's an eighth notes delay, but stereo. So it's left and right are slightly different. You can tweak that down here. Right. This is my stereo delay that I just like. It's the analog delay yeah. setting and a little, little yeah. Sorry. Yeah, so again, like that's uh, that's actually a good point, Benny, is that you made your own one, yeah. but it is one of those just ones that seems to work over and over again. So totally. just keep it thrown up. Yeah, totally. Great. Certain IRs, I have a spring reverb here that I love on lead guitars. It's an IR that I just loaded into this, um, and it's called Sp Great Spring Reverb Stereo, whatever. I don't tweak any of that. It's just the IR as it is, and I love it on lead guitars, and it just, I use it all the time. Um, so Sweet. yeah, there are a couple of, of these things that I just go to that just seem seem to work for me. Um, you can see if there's anything else, but I think that's that's pretty much it. Yeah, I mean, I mean, those yeah. are all yeah. really great examples of just like, yeah, these are presets that are set the same way in the mix, and you yep. see if they work. And then if not, you either take it off or you can make a slight tweak um, because you've taken the time to learn the plugin as well. Um, yeah, I mean, I've, that was plenty of examples, but the one that comes to mind for me is... Uh, the Cornif Audio Pawn Shop Comp 2 has like a bottom snare preset. Oh, wow. uh, yeah, that's good. I, I think it's called uh, bottom snare splat, but maybe I'm just adding that splat word because it is what it does. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just the descriptive yeah. word of what it sounds like after yeah. that. And it's just perfect. Like it's like either I want a bottom snare to sound exactly like this or I don't. And I throw it on. It's such a dramatic change, but it turns into like the, the, the most squeezed splat ever. And now I've now I'm there, kind of thing. It, it's great, um, and uh, yeah, that's that's one that I use constantly on bottom snares where I really want that that sound. It's just so obvious to me. Um, there's a detuning delay in the Crystallizer by Sound Toys. That's oh, yeah. another one actually. It's just like the only way I know how to get that sound is that preset. It's like this weird reverse pitched delay thing. And it's it's like Benny said, it's too weird of an effect to, for me to spend time learning how to recreate that with different tools. Yeah. So I can just click this button <laughs> and get that weird, crazy, spacey, dreamy effect. And now I've got it. Absolutely. Um, that reminds me of, like, there's one more that I wanted to tell people. And I'm not going to share the screen again, but like, there is one, just looking at the, the category here in, 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 in uh, Echo Boy. Ah, oh, where where is it? Something like Star Stardust something. Do you know that preset? I don't know that one, no. Ah, damn. Shout out to Jay Moss. My friend Jay Moss is like uh he, I think he uses that all the time and I've tried it once and it does a thing that only this this preset does. I'm trying to look it up now. You gotta try it. It's really, really awesome. In Sound Toys, there is this weird category that you wouldn't be able to do yourself anyways, like these sound design and feedbackers and, and in these categories, I'm just looking at it right now, uh, where there's like so much cool thing, so many cool things to discover in there that it, there's no way I would come up with that on my own. So yeah, yeah. I, like the, yeah, sometimes presets go beyond learning the plugin almost like, like Saturn two has so much beneath the hood that goes beyond 99.9% .9 of the use cases that I want Saturn 2 for. <laughs> but yeah. it is there if you want to dig that deep. And presets are kind of the way of unlocking what that's capable of. Because you just probably wouldn't even discover some of that stuff just going on your own. Oh, to totally. Yeah, totally. So is there any... Let me try and think of this. Like, Do, do you ever use like not just presets, but like entire chains of plugins as presets, as like track presets? Mm, track presets. Yeah, that's a good thing to bring up that we didn't even mention in this episode so far. A track preset is when you like your DAW will let you set a preset for that track that will load a bunch of plugins at their desired setting. So it's like multiple presets for multiple plugins all at once. Very cool idea and workflow that could save so much time. And my answer is no, never use them ever. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Because you were just too lazy to create them or? No, because I never, I, I don't like re work repeatably enough for that to ever be useful for me. Um, yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. It, the exception would be, okay, that's not entirely true actually. 
Mm-hmm. When I do start a mix, I have a mixing template, like an whole entire session template that I drag my tracks into. Mm-hmm. And some of those have multiple plugins sitting on them. Um, so I guess in a way, yes, they're, they're, that's already built in, but I'm not loading them as like, oh, I need my snare bottom channel ch- strip kind of thing. I don't think in channel strips. I get too yeah. individual for that. Um, I think it's a great idea. It's just not the way my brain wants to work. Okay, but do you use, you do use a mix template, right? I do use a mix template, but it's almost a routing template more than it's a mixing template. Ah, okay, okay, because, okay, yeah. So, see, the thing is, I don't save a lot of, like, track presets either, but I'm actually using them all the time just because my preset, uh, my my template is just basically a bunch of track presets also. Like, it's routing, but also there is a lot of things... The, the only thing is that I, it's all turned off when I start mixing, so it's not that the processing is all on when I start yes, the mix. It's the same, yeah, it's almost all uh, zeroed out for me. Um, but the, the options are there. Be, the, the chains are there, right? Yeah, but the chains are there, so like I can just enable the plugin mm-hmm. to speed that up kind of thing. Um, but but yeah, they're, it's pretty rare that they're already assigned a value even for me. They're pretty much at default. Um, uh, and then the, the exception would be, again, my effects tracks, those have like the you know my uh, quarter delay is going to have a quarter delay on it my slapback delay is going to have slapback delay and i'll probably have an eq on that track that's already carving out the frequencies that i generally want saturation's already turned up on that track um so it's kind of a yeah a yes and no but for the most part mostly a no okay yeah yeah, um, I, d- I don't know. I've had I have a lot of like chains that generally work for me that I use in my te- my um, template actually. But uh, yeah, the, it's all turned off. It's starting points, and I have the way I do it is I have a couple of options. So I might have two or three different compressors on a drum crush mm-hmm. bus, for example, and then I just audition them. And the the reason I have them is more or less just so I don't I don't have to go through the folders of plugins and plugins yeah. and plugins that I have. I have so many of them. I don't want to look at all of my 78 compressors. I just want a small selection that I can audition. And that's why I have them in there and have certain chains. Not because I couldn't do it with other tools, but it's like, I don't need all these options. So Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm very similar in that. Like Pawn Shop Comp, that compressor I've mentioned like three times in this episode, and the CLA 76 compressor. Yeah. Uh, they're both sitting on many of my tracks, just neither of them turned on. But I can turn on either one of them in a moment. Uh, I can audition both, or maybe I just know instinctually which one's probably going to be the fit. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Uh, all, all right. I found it, by the way. So again, thank you, Jay Moss, for showing me that. If you go to, if you have Echo Boy and you go to Reverbs and Spaces, like there's these these um, folders of presets in Echo Boy, and under Reverbs and Spaces, you find Starlight is what it's called, not Stardust, Starlight, and just try that whenever you want something very long, ambient, lush. That I like you see what it does when you like you hear what it does. It's like I love this preset, and yeah. So sorry, Jay, for giving that away, but I also saw you post it on Instagram. So <laughs> it's public. <laughs> yeah. So that one's really cool too. I don't use it too often because it's very extreme, but when it works, it works perfectly. It's one of these things. It's either works or doesn't. It's, and and also, if you listen to our episode with Brandon Decora, by the way. Uh, that I interviewed on the show, and I was on his show too. He shared th- his Buck Ram secret with me, which is a lexicon patch preset, whatever. That's called Buck Ram, and there's an IR for that that I have now that I use all the time. And I he uses it on snares. I use it the exact same way since you've told me. I don't use it every time, but very often because it just adds this little bit of extra length to a snare when it needs it. If you overdo it, it's, it ruins it, but just a tiny bit of it is awesome. And Brandon shared this with me and it seems to work for me as well. So yeah, sometimes awesome. I do take this advice and apply it, but like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there you go. There you go. It's, uh, I, I hope this wasn't too confusing of an episode. I, I like really ultimately, I just hope it gets you to think about how you're thinking about presets and, and plug in presets and just, are you learning from them? Are you relying on them when you shouldn't be? Um, because while we did have some where we're like, yeah, we just, this preset's a kind of a go-to, that's not very many of those, right? And even then, they're not every mix. It's just like, a, it's just quicker to get to certain things that way. But in general, you have to be pretty intentional as always. I, I hope you learned that by now listening to this podcast, <laughs> especially the last two episodes. Yeah, totally. And I love this episode because the fact that it's so... 
that it can go both ways and we contradicted ourselves here. This is exactly what it needs to be because this is a good example of like, you can now take this advice or this advice. At the end of the day, you have to figure out what works for you. And like, this is exactly it with presets, right? There, There is no one way to mix a record. There's countless ways to get there. And at the end of the day, what you just said is it, Malcolm, you need to be intentional and you need to be smart and use presets when they work because they are a workflow enhancement tool. They are amazing. They are inspirational sometimes. They are fun and all that, but don't use them as a crutch. If you if you don't know how to get there, just take the time to learn it and then use the presets to make it easier for you or to find inspiration. But don't use the presets instead of learning how it works. Yeah, exactly. Okay, cool. And then also get in, build the habit of creating your own. That's really a thing you should do, I think. Create your own presets and starting points. You'll find certain things that just tend to work for you and you'll get faster and faster over time if you do that. So. Yep, yeah. And uh, anytime you can make something repeatable, a, 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 or yeah, anytime you're doing something repeatable, a preset makes sense. Yes. So it's like, this is the guitar sound I'm going to want on the whole record. Save that entire thing as a preset. You can just load it up for the next song, save yourself a bunch of work. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, I got a good, a good example too before we wrap this up real quick. There are certain special effects or things I need over and over again in, in mixes, which is where like when a band wants a very classic radio effect or megaphone effect or yes. lo-fi yeah, thing okay. or whatever, I definitely have presets for those. Uh, or like in Cubase you have, what's the equivalent in Pro Tools where you, in Cubase it's called Audio Suite where you basically bake the processing into the track and not use it as a plugin. You can like select a clip and then directly apply it to that. Mm-hmm. There's a thing in Pro Tools as well. I don't remember the name of it. It's Audio Suite in Pro Tools. So it's Audio Suite in Pro Tools. Yeah. Then it's not Audio Suite in, in, in Cubase. Yeah, well, see like, that happens when you mix up the DAWs <laughs> uh, and you work in different DAWs at once. Anyway, and then it's just oh no, it's Direct Off Offline Processing. It's called uh-huh. di- Direct Offline Processing. It's called in Cubase Audio Suite in Pro Tools. Yeah. But so in there, in Cubase, you can save chains and presets and things like that as well. So when I'm like, okay, they want these two words to be lo-fi with a slight megaphone, the delay, whatever. Like I have all kinds of presets like that. And I just select this clip, I click a button, and it does this macro basically of like a couple of plugins in a row. It gives me exactly that sound. I would be stupid to do that every single time the same way over and over again if I know I'm going to be doing that anyways. So yeah. Yeah. These are things like that. Okay, cool. Thank you so much for listening. Feel free to share your favorite presets with us, by the way. I'd be very curious to see that. So if you see that on YouTube, comment below. Give us your favorite presets that you've discovered and let's just share these and, and see if they work for us or not. Like It's always helpful to, to and fun to do that, I think. So if you That's have right. anything or any special trick you discovered, I'd love to know. Comment yeah, below. Yeah, I'd love that. Amazing. Cool. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, our next week, we're going to be in Europe together recording some episodes with guests and stuff like that. So uh, cool podcast episodes on the way. Yeah. Actually, when this airs, we're probably in Hamburg right now. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. By the time you're listening to this, Benny and I are in the same room. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Same continent. Same Looking continent. forward to this a lot. And then you're going to see... Um, oh, yeah. And then next time you're going to get... Um, so this, yeah, this means that next week probably, or today or whenever, you'll get three special episodes directly from Studio Cine with amazing guests that will be interviewing live at the studio sofa there. It's going to be awesome. Yeah, it's going to be good. Cool. All right. See you then. Adios. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye. <laughs>